Hey buddy, watch this. Hello, hello, Regis Kilbin is the name and Hearthstone is the game. And these are my five reasons that I think Arcane Giant might actually be the most OP giant of all. And frankly, might be one of the most oppressive cards that Hearthstone has seen in its long history. Uh, time will tell. This is still day one for Arcane Giant, but he's already popping up and inspiring a wide variety of decks. And I think he's going to spiral further out of control and become the kind of card that is very bad for Hearthstone. So this, of course, is the card in question, the new Arcane Giant from One Night in Karazhan. It looks a lot like other giants. It has a 12 mana cost, an 8-8 body, and an effect that hopefully makes it cheaper throughout the course of the game. You can see the other giants that have been released here. Some played more than others, certainly. The potential of some still to be seen, perhaps, uh, just depending on different synergies. But I am proposing that Arcane Giant, for a variety of design reasons, is actually vastly superior to every other giant that we've seen in the set so far. I think this card is just outright better, more playable in a, a much wider variety of decks, and much more oppressive in the way it uh, affects your opponent's state of mind and perhaps even their state of board. So here are really the five reasons I think Arcane Giant is stronger than its giant brothers, right? These are uh, design principles or design theories uh, that the effect on this card works so much better than all the others. So the first of which is tempo. Number two, we've got control of the effect, uh, the lack of risk inherent in the card at number three, the permanence of its effect at number four, and finally, uh, the influence on deck construction, or perhaps even the lack thereof, in that Arcane Giant doesn't really force you uh, to change your deck much at all. Now, I just ran through those, but we're going to go through each of those in a little bit of detail in this video, starting off with number one, and that, of course, is Tempo. And I think this is really the most important of all of these ad design advantages from Arcane Giant. Now, when I say Tempo, I don't mean uh, just getting minions out on curve onto the board in the early game. Tempo is not a measure of board advantage. Tempo is a measure of mana efficiency and the way in which you can spend mana uh, on curve and quickly and always utilize the mana available to you and outpace your opponent when it comes to mana efficiency. So this isn't about board presence. This is specifically about utilizing your mana quickly and efficiently. And in that regard, you want cards, of course, that don't slow down your tempo too much. You want cards that allow you to keep up and don't fall too far behind. And there are some giants that are very bad at that. Specifically, Frost Giant and Mountain Giant are two cards that do tend to slow down your tempo. They both reward slower plays. Uh, specifically with Frost Giant, right, you, you want a hero power. You have to hero power 10 times to make this card free, which is a total cost of 20 mana. And typically, hero powering for most classes is not an efficient way to spend your mana, particularly in the early game, because a, a hero power, a, a totem, or a silver hand recruit doesn't trade effectively into the board. Your opponent gets to kill it practically for free half the time. So your mana is mostly getting wasted, while their mana is accruing them resources, accruing them board advantage, giving them tempo. Uh, so Frost Giant can very much slow you down if you're trying to play it for zero mana, relatively quickly in the game. Same can be said for Mountain Giant, of course. As you accrue cards, typically you're not spending those cards and you're you're having leftover mana. That doesn't do anything because you're saving all your cards in order to make a big play with Mountain Giant, as we've seen historically with Handlock, typically on turn four. So both of those do tend to punish your tempo and have to be played in decks with a much slower curve and a much slower goal for the late game, so control style decks. But there are a lot of giants that don't necessarily slow your tempo. Uh, nothing about Molten Giant's design inherently slows you down. It's typically going to be better in the late game because you've taken more damage. But you can still play minions on curve. And uh, Molten Giant can still be playable later on. Unlike Frost Giant and Molten Giant. Excuse me, Frost Giant and Mountain Giant, which do require you to slow things down. Uh, sea Giant actually is typically pretty good in regards to tempo. You can play a lot of minions very quickly. Spend all that mana very quickly and still get the Sea Giant out. Clockwork Giant, there's nothing inherent about it that uh, slows your tempo down because it's all dependent upon what your opponent is doing. And then, of course, there's Arcane Giant, which also doesn't slow you down. Uh, typically, you want to cast spells. Spells are a very efficient uh, 
uh, ways to contest the board and keep up with your opponent. Virtually every deck has spells, and they're usually at flexible mana cost, so they fit right in. They don't normally punish you in regards to mana efficiency and often reward you in regards to mana efficiency. So in many ways, this is a tempo rewarding card, much like Sea Giant. Do stuff to the board. Get out there, cast spells, and you'll have an Arcane Giant waiting for you. And I, I think that you can kind of tell from this list that Sea Giant is probably the most popular giant right now in the meta and has historically been played a lot in aggressive decks. Uh, Molten Giant also was a very playable card in the past, less so since it has been nerfed in regards to mana cost. But um, there is a certain bias towards the cards on the top half of this screen uh, towards playability, and I think Arcane Giant, of course, will fit into that, uh, that same hierarchy and perhaps be played even more than the others. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to, to the design advantage number two, and that is the control that you have as a player over the effect of the card. So in other words, with a card like Molten Giant, uh, you don't normally have all that much control over how much damage your hero has taken. Uh, now, Handlock is a class that, or excuse me, a deck archetype that used Molten Giant most often and most notably in Hearthstone's history, and they did have some control, of course, over their health via Life Tap. You can damage yourself to get out those Molten Giants faster. But your opponent still has a, a very big say in the matter, right? They control it as well, to the extent that I can remember some strategies back in the day to counter Handlock was just don't damage them. Never hit their face. Just sit on a giant board, build up a big board until you have enough damage to kill them in a single turn, and that negates two of their most powerful cards in Molten Giant. So that was a, a very real risk that Handlock could face from time to time. Uh, with Sea Giant, you have some control again, uh, by playing your own minions, but your opponent can remove minions, your opponent doesn't have to play minions, so it makes it much less likely you're able to get out a Sea Giant at a reasonable cost. Clockwork Giant, of course, you have virtually zero control over its effect outside of perhaps some mill-style decks that could load up your opponent's hand. So uh, it's, it's probably the lowest control of all, though, because your opponent clearly determines how many cards they have in their hand a majority of the time. But then on the top half of this list, you have cards that you have pretty much full control over. Uh, with Arcane Giant, of course, you determine how many spells you run in your deck, and you determine how many spells you cast, building up to that Arcane Giant. Same can be said with Mountain Giant and card resources, and of course, Frost Giant with uh, hero powers. So all the giants at the top, you get to pick when and how you activate this effect, and how cheap and how quickly you activate that effect. So it allows a lot more flexibility in how the card is utilized and much more consistency, I would argue, in how the card is utilized as well. So moving on to number three, yet another advantage where Arcane Giant appears on the top half of the page as a good card, and that is the lack of risk inherent in these cards' designs. Now, when I say risk, I mean uh, potential for things to backfire in a major way. So for instance, with Molten Giant, seems to be the go-to example. There's quite a bit of risk in this card if you want to activate it because you have to put yourself at such a low health total. If you want to get it for free, you have to go down essentially to five health, and that's risky because there's always a fireball waiting across the screen. So a ton of risk with Molten Giant, and that was typically mitigated uh, via taunt activators so that your opponent would still have trouble getting through to kill you, uh, but a ton of risk there. Uh, sea Giant may not sound like that risky of a card, but it actually is risky normally to play a lot of low-cost, susceptible, weak minions, which is typically how you get a Sea Giant out. You play a lot of tokens, a lot of one-health stuff, and you're able to play that Sea Giant. That's risky uh, twofold because it makes your board very weak and because your opponent can very easily remove those things. But the other side of Sea Giant's riskiness is that it's often rewarded when your opponent has a lot of minions. So in Zoo-style decks that ran the Sea Giant... Uh, you'd see it come out most often when your opponent had a big board that enabled you to kind of counter or swing back with your own Sea Giant, and that's risky because you don't want your opponent to have a ton of minions because they can contest the board and kill you. Clockwork Giant is risky because your opponent just has a ton of cards in hand, and that's a very scary proposition. <laughs> uh, but as far as the cards with less risk, we've got the top half here. Uh, Mountain Giant... You might argue, oh, it's very risky to sit on a handful of cards because that means you haven't done anything, your opponent's going to swarm the board. And that's very true, but that's actually already been discussed and captured 
in our section on tempo. So I don't want to punish a card twice for the same thing. This is risk in a vacuum almost, right? So yeah, Mountain Giant, we already said, is very bad as far as tempo is concerned. But there's nothing actually inherently risky about having a handful of cards. In fact, that's often a very rewarding thing. If you consider it in a vacuum and you don't consider the tempo side of it, having a handful of cards is good because you have so much control and flexibility over what your plays are. Uh, Frost Giant, in the same way, uh, yes, there's a tempo risk inherent to it, but uh, there's actually not anything risky about playing Hero Power. That is a positive contribution to the game. So um, there's no risk in that. And Arcane Giant, same way, casting spells is not risky. Uh, this is a card that you can just keep in your hand or keep in your deck, and you don't have to punish yourself or take a, a huge risk in order to, to see it played. So yet another advantage for Arcane Giant here compared to a few other giants. And you'll note that some of these cards are appearing on the top half of the screen, some are more regularly appearing on the bottom, but Arcane Giant so far... I guess is the only one that has always been on the top, and that is going to be a theme, of course, throughout this video. As we move on to number four, and this is the permanence of the effect. Uh, two giants here have an effect that is consistent and permanent no matter what happens in the game. Once you've triggered that card effect, it lasts forever throughout the rest of the game. So once you hero power, you've reduced the cost of Frost Giant, whether it's in your hand, whether it's still in your deck, uh, it's always going to cost nine or eight or seven as you move through hero power. So you're, you're making that active constantly. Same with Arcane Giant. Every time you cast a spell, the cost is permanently reduced. So it doesn't matter if you've seen it yet or not, you're contributing to that cost way down the road, which is nice. But of course, on the other side of things, a lot of these cards don't have permanent effects at all. They're, they're in fact, uh, very flaky effects. Molten Giant is maybe the most permanent of this set along the bottom in that typically your health doesn't fluctuate a ton, but of course um, if you want to Reno Jackson back to full, it might be hard to play your Molten Giant as well if it uh, costs more than four, and then you may never get to play your Molten Giant again, so there's still a lot of uh, variability when it comes to your health total too. Uh, sea Giant, the board is always in flux, so you never know if there's going to be enough minions to reduce that cost. Mountain Giant, you might need to play cards to make sure you don't just die or lose, so it becomes much more expensive or cheaper dependent upon the board state. And finally, Clockwork Giant is really the least permanent of all because you have very little control over your opponent's hand and they get to play cards at their leisure as well. So uh, these cards are much less consistent in their effect. You don't know that you can build up to them. They might be a dead draw later. They might be a 12 mana mountain giant, or I guess an 11 mana mountain giant most of the time, or a, you know a 10 mana sea giant. They're not necessarily playable. The contributions you make to their effect don't last forever, and with arcane giant, they do. Anytime you cast that spell, you know it's paying off later. You know you're getting a positive beneficial effect from casting a spell. So you don't feel guilty about casting a spell. You don't feel regretful at all. With Molten Giant, you might feel bad about life tapping once or twice. If it turns out you can't play the Molten Giant anyway, and you've taken that damage specifically for a goal with Molten Giant in a big swing turn that never actually occurs. With Arcane Giant, that doesn't happen. It's always good. And then finally, as we move on to the fifth design advantage of Arcane Giant, and that is the influence of the card on deck construction, or really, I think I should say the, the lack of influence. In other words, the more limiting cards on this screen often require you to design your deck around them. They're built around cards that have such a specific effect that you have to consider that when making your deck. So with Mountain Giant and Molten Giant, of course, that was handlock uh, most historically most recognizably throughout history, and, and Handlock was built to utilize those cards. It had all the Taunt Givers with Sun Fury Protector and Defender of Argus. It had Life Tap to encourage Molten Giants and Mountain Giants that, that only fit into one class of one deck archetype specifically to make those cards work. And really, we haven't seen those cards be that popular since just because there's never been a deck designed so specifically to fit them. With Sea Giant, of course, it can kind of be tossed into some decks 
but typically you have to have some sort of token generator mechanism or at least some way to really flood the board with minions in order to make Sea Giant work. Clockwork Giant has really never been played, so it's hardly worth discussing at all, but you would need a, a sort of mill mechanism to make that card playable also. You'd have to totally change how your deck works. I just noticed that there is a typo <laughs> at the top of my screen that says the influence on deck can such Concentricton. <laughs> so forgive me for that, guys. I'm not willing to re-record the whole video to fix that typo, um, but that's pretty funny. Uh, but back into it, uh, Arcane Giant and Frost Giant, on the other hand, can basically be tossed into any deck. I would argue that Frost Giant is perhaps a little limiting. It almost belongs in the middle of the screen if I had a sort of neutral category, just because it, it really can't be played in an aggressive style deck, but virtually any controller late game deck could toss in a frost giant it wouldn't necessarily work well but there's nothing about its design that forces you down a narrow path of design when it comes to your deck construction arcane giant on the other hand feels like it could be tossed into almost any deck outside of some super aggressive minion based decks because almost everybody runs spells every deck has you know, 5 to 10, even 15 spells, depending on the deck. And there are so many other strong spell synergy cards right now, namely with a card like Yog saron that a lot of decks are skewing more spell-heavy than minion-heavy anyway. So at least in this current meta specifically, Arcane Giant seems to fit a much wider array of decks. Now, there may be some metas where it's much more minion-focused, uh, but with this many spells... Arcane Giant feels like the kind of card that could be played almost anywhere by almost any class, and I, it takes very little to shift your deck towards making Arcane Giant viable, so it's much less limiting when it comes to constructing your deck. And since it's so good at all those other four points and also happens to fit in so many different decks, that's what makes the card so scary, right? If it had an effect that was only really, really good in one specific deck archetype, that's the kind of thing you could counter, you could play around. The meta could shift itself to adjust against that deck specifically. But when a card like Arcane Giant is so good against so many things and in so many things, that's when a card becomes oppressive. That's when you see it in every deck. That is the Dr. Boom of the world. And that's not healthy for Hearthstone, and it's certainly not healthy at all. Um, so what happens if we arbitrarily kind of scored these cards based on those five design advantages? And let's say we give each card one point when it showed up on the top, top half of the screen in the, in the good category for those design advantages. Uh, unfortunately, Clockwork Giant, Mountain Giant, Sea Giant didn't rank very well. Uh, they only got one total point. Mountain Giant wasn't much better at two, uh, but... You can see there's a gap, and then you've got Frost Giant and Arcane Giant, specifically Frost Giant at the 4, and Arcane Giant at the number 5 spot. Now, this might look a little unusual, but I think it does uh, breed some interesting discussion. Clearly, Arcane Giant is vastly superior. That's to be expected. Obviously, this is a biased video. I'm creating the video and the design category specifically to talk about Arcane Giant. Now, that's say I don't think I'm doing it in an unfair way, but it's obviously going to be at the top. But the really surprising card to me is Frost Giant at the number four spot. And you might be saying, well, Frost Giant, if it's good in so many categories, why isn't it played more? Because we hardly ever see Frost Giant in decks. It's super rare to see. It only popped up in a couple really high-end decks and not even that well then. And I think that's because if you go back and you look at the categories, Frost Giant uh, failed in the tempo category. The very first category we discussed... It was on the bottom half. And I think even though it's good everywhere else, and you can see a lot of similarity in its effect to Arcane Giant's effect, the fact that it really punishes you on tempo makes it a much less playable card, even though its arbitrary score here looks pretty decent. So I still think that number one category is the most important. Cards that by design punish your tempo are very, very hard to play in any sort of aggressive meta, and Hearthstone has basically had an aggressive meta forever. So Frost Giant, even though it works on a lot of ways, that's really the one thing that slows it down. If there were more mechanisms to give you free hero powers, uh, so you could just kind of toss them out, and those counted as an activation of Frost Giant, then you'd see the card played more often. But you might also be surprised to see Sea Giant at the, at the one spot, because it seems like Sea Giant is a card that has been played 
quite a bit. And to some extent, I think that's true. Uh, perhaps that's one of the slight failings in the system. And again, I did say this is sort of arbitrary, right? Um, but I'm not surprised to see Mountain Molden or Clockwork Giant down there. Those are cards that have really gotten worse throughout the history of Hearthstone. They're very unplayed today and, and hard to build around. And I think their, their strictness and their limitations as far as deck construction are concerned have really uh, kept them pushed down. Uh, but Sea Giant, even though it's a very positive tempo play, um, it's, it's still not a card that's predictable or consistent, and that makes it hard. And even though you see it in some zoo archetypes, uh, I think that's probably even going to go away a little bit too as the, as the meta becomes more um, spell centered and as people start to run removal to deal with arcane giant cards like sea giant still get worse as well so uh this just reinforces the the notion that as far as i'm concerned arcane giant is vastly better than every other giant we've seen and this this video specifically just compared it to other giants in the past uh, which is a cool exercise, but you can sort of take these same design principles, the, the tempo and the lack of risk and all that stuff, and apply it to other cards as well. So, for instance, another card that comes to mind, of course, um, is the thing from below, the Shaman card that, that gets cheaper each time you summon a totem. And that card is, is often compared pretty specifically to Frost Giant because totems are from your hero power. But, of course, what makes Thing from Below so good is that Shaman has other ways to summon totems than just of the other hero power. So it's a much less tempo punishment than it is with Frost Giant. And Arcane Giant feels like that kind of card. Like, you don't hate playing Tuskar Totemic to get a thing from below. You don't hate playing Flame Tongue Totem. Well, guess what? You don't hate playing Fireball. You don't hate playing Frostbolt and all the other spells that activate Arcane Giant as well. So it's the same kind of card, but also has a bigger payoff as it's an 8-8 body instead of a 5-5 so this card is the kind of card that's going to be played on turn 4 for a little bit of mana in Tempo Mage. It's going to be played for free on turn 10 in Token Druid. Uh, it's going to be played for free by Miracle Rogue. Uh, Control Warriors, even, if they needed another body, guess what? They're going to find one just because they have so many different removal spells that can make Arcane Giant very cheap. And then if, <laughs> to double down on all the synergies that this card already presents and causes problems for. You've also got Yang Saran in the meta. That's just another oppressive way to take advantage of spells. So I, it feels like very soon Hearthstone is going to be spell, 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 Arcane Giant, Arcane Giant, Yang Saran. And that's why <laughs> that's gonna be every deck's basic uh, functionality. Cause I think those two cards are so strong and, and work so well in the design space of Hearthstone that uh, they just can't be ignored, and decks are going to have to shift towards either including them or answering them specifically, or somehow trying to kill your opponent fast enough that they don't have time to utilize that. But of course, spells are actually quite good at uh, contesting the board and stalling out games. So I think Hearthstone just became the Arcane Giant Yog saron show, and I don't think that's a good thing for the game. So that's going to do it for my... Uh, you know, in-depth look here at Arcane Giant and the five reasons it's probably the most OP of all giants and maybe even one of the most OP cards in Hearthstone. I'm sure you have some thoughts and comments of, the, of your own, so you know where to share those. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, game on.